time. We still don't know what it really is, but we can measure it. One way we measure time on Earth is the simple passage of events, such as the day, from sunrise to sunset and back again. If we want to dig into the past, we have written records spanning thousands of years, and we have geologic processes and buried fossils spanning billions of years. Elsewhere in the solar system, such as looking to our nearest neighbor, the moon, we don't have any of these methods to examine the flow of time and when what happened in the past. Practically the only method we have to study when things happened on any other surface in the solar system is with impact craters. Impacts form when an extraplanetary object strikes the surface of a body, releasing enough energy in the process to excavate a large hole, and we see literally millions of these across the moon. These are approximately random events, both with respect to time and location on the body. This means that we can use craters as relative age markers. If a surface has a lot of craters, it should be older than a surface that has just a few craters because the more heavily cratered surface has had more time to accumulate them. We've used this basic idea for decades to understand the stratigraphy, the relative ages, of the different regions of each solid planet, moon, and asteroid that we've seen in the solar system. The next step to move from relative ages to absolute ages is to tie the spatial density of craters to something that we know the age of. To do that, we need a surface that has a certain population of craters, and we need to know when that surface was reset and started to accumulate those craters. The Apollo and Luna sample return missions from the Moon let us do this. These missions returned rocks and other material that has been dated by radiometric methods to provide an absolute age of that surface. With the age, the remaining step is to identify craters. This is what this new work focused on because a thorough examination of all the landing site's craters by one person at one time has never been attempted, and it has not been done with new image data since Apollo over 40 years ago. Let's look at the Apollo 15 site as an example. The lander, named Falcon, touched down on the eastern edge of the large dark area called Mare Imbrium, or the Sea of Rains in Latin. They landed near Hadley Rill, the large valley running through the area. The first step is to identify regions of the surface that the astronauts sampled in order to link the rock samples to the crater density. These four areas being outlined are what I mapped. The next step was to remove the features that could affect the crater counts. You'll see that I didn't include Hadley Rill, or the large crater near the bottom, or any of the mountains. I also didn't include fields of secondary craters, craters that form not from extraplanetary impacts, but from the material ejected from another event. These tend to have characteristic shapes, and I removed them from consideration. After all of the mapping, I identified craters and measured their diameters. After the craters for a region are identified, we graph their diameters on what we call a size-frequency distribution. This shows the diameter on the x-axis, and it sums the craters from large to small on the y-axis. That way, every point to the left of another is the sum of all craters that are larger than it, as shown in the vertical axis on the right. On the vertical axis on the left, I've scaled these craters to the surface area that I mapped. This means that the one kilometer diameter point, read from the left axis, represents the spatial density of all craters larger than one kilometers in my mapped area. This one kilometer diameter point is important for the lunar chronology. It's for this and only this spatial density, the density of craters on a surface that are larger than one kilometer, that the lunar chronology is defined. It's so important that we have our own abbreviation for it, N1. This means that we need N1 for all of the other landing sites. After a lot of mapping and crater identification, here they are, with the colors indicating radiometric age from independent work. You'll notice that not all of the crater counts overlap the one kilometer diameter point, and other sites seem to have slightly different shapes, indicating that something probably affected their crater population. 
That means that we need to use a model of what the crater population should look like, scale it to the craters that we do have, and figure out the n1 point from those models. This isn't perfect, especially when the models disagree, but it's the best that we have at this point in time. With the n1 for each site, either from a model or by directly measuring it, we have the crater spatial density. Since all we care about is n1, we can get rid of the diameter axis, the x-axis on this graph, but we want to keep that n1 value on the y-axis. So, we replace the x-axis with radiometric age of the samples collected. Then, you fit a function to the data. This function, the lunar chronology function, means that if you measure the spatial density of craters anywhere on the surface and find n1, you can use this chronology function to estimate the age. We can transfer it to Mars, Mercury, Venus, and elsewhere in the solar system through dynamical models, and it forms the basis of our timescales for what happened when on the surfaces of other worlds. This new work that I've done is different from ones in the past because of the better crater data. The one that people have used for several decades is shown in red, based on the work by the late Gerhard Neukam. You'll notice that the crater counts are different, and that's the reason why the curve is different. There are four main reasons why my crater counts are different. One, earlier researchers did not always identify craters on the same surface that was sampled. Two, the N1 points were often extrapolated from larger or smaller craters based on models and not directly measured. While I couldn't fix all of that, I was able to measure N1 more directly than other people. Three, the area occupied by secondary crater clusters was not excluded in previous work, and when you're trying to measure a spatial density, you have to get the area correct. Four, Poor quality images were sometimes used that limited the ability to identify craters. But that doesn't mean that my work is the first to be different from the chronology that most people use. In fact, a range of crater densities have been found over the years. That doesn't mean that I'm right and that previous work is wrong, or that previous work is right and I'm wrong. This is one more iterative step along the way to coming to a better consensus about the impact history of the Moon. After understanding why my results are different, we can look at how they are different from previous work. First, I found more craters at several landing sites than the classic work, meaning that my function is larger over much of the Moon's history. Second, the new chronology is approximately linear for another 200 million years back in time. This is controlled primarily by the Apollo 11 and 17 landing site crater counts, where I found crater densities less than what other researchers have found. Third, the exponential function is much deeper. This is because the function is approximately linear further back in time, but the crater rate still has to match the data point for the older Apollo 16 landing site, which is off this chart, where I found crater densities almost identical with previous researchers. We can look at what this means for modeled surface ages based on craters. One consequence of this revised chronology is that surfaces that had been dated to about 3.6 to 3.9 billion years old before are now up to about 200 million years older in my new chronology. Put another way, this means that it takes fewer craters to be that old. In the other direction, anything younger than about 3.5 billion years old from the other chronology is up to about 1 billion years younger, or that it takes more craters to be as old as we thought it did. What does this mean for solar system processes? It means that, in general, events occurred more recently than previously thought. For example, the volcanism on Mars and Venus that we think died out a few hundred million years ago persisted perhaps halfway closer to the present day, or that lakes and rivers on Mars could have been flowing several hundred million years more recently. Moving forward, what can we do to better constrain the chronology? There are a couple of different research avenues, but two are apparent from this movie. First, 
a glaring gap is present in the samples, where we have no samples that can be tied to a terrain from practically 2 to 3 billion years of lunar history. More samples would significantly help our understanding of what happened during this time. And we can't just take rocks from the moon that have landed on Earth. We have to actually go there to get samples that are from a specific terrain so that we can link them to the crater counts. Second is that it is difficult to tie the old with the young. Not only is there this gap, but the youngest terrains are small. They've not been around long enough to accumulate large craters, and hence N1 must be extrapolated by using a model. Better and more consistent models would help link the old with the young. Science tends to be an iterative process. We stand on the shoulders of giants. As we get more and better data, our models get closer and closer to explaining how the universe works and what happens as we pass through it, not only in space, but with time.